Hello students, uh, Professor Cynic here, and I know I'm a little bit late with the New Year's resolutions, but I figured I should start paying attention to my figure. And the idea of a balanced diet and regular exercise is egregiously repulsive. So I decided I'm going to do a fad diet. After some extensive research, the one I landed on is the Paleo Diet. The goal of this is a return to foods that early humans would have had access to. Because doing things the way humans used to is almost always the better option. Almost always. And it's not like after millions of years of evolution that humans are really that different. I mean, we're, we're, we're pretty much the same as our ancestors. We haven't changed. We, have, we haven't changed much. But anyway, I'm having some troubles with the diet. Uh, guilty as charged. I have a bit of a sweet tooth. I'm sure that when Homo sapien first emerged from the messy affair that is evolution, they didn't walk into a bakery with limitless cupcake options. You tasty, delicious little fuckers. But anyway, to curb my temptations, I figured that a stern voice to discourage me would be my best option. But it can't just be any voice, no, 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 no. It needs to be a voice of godly proportions. So, see, this is what happens when I lift the lid. Boy. 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 I think that'll do. Change is tough. But you know what? Speaking of change, I recently graded the new God of War. It's certainly a change of pace from the previous titles. Why don't we take a look? Careful. Boy. There's spoilers ahead. Skip ahead to this part in the video to see the narrative grade sans spoilers. God of War takes a course change in this reboot. Instead of ancient Greece, this title takes place in the lands of North mythology, starting in Midgard where Kratos has traveled to escape his past. The game opens with Kratos chopping down trees to build a fire to cremate the body of his wife. At this point you're introduced to his son, Atreus. From the onset you can tell the relationship between father and son is very uneasy. Kratos acts like, well, Kratos, albeit slightly less murdery and Atreus has a temperament that you would expect from a young boy. Well, a young boy who was promised a puppy, but instead was brought to a pound and shown multiple instances of euthanasia to make the point that all things die, so why would you want a puppy if it's going to die anyway? The point I'm making is the relationship is not an amicable one from the onset. This is where the journey begins. It was Atreus' mother's wish that her ashes be brought to the highest point in all the realms to be scattered. Before they set out, they're met by a stranger who looks like he stepped out of a Midgard methadone clinic. It would appear that he is also a god, and so Kratos does battle with him. Kratos wins, and they continue their way up to the highest peak. Fairly early in the game, you reach what Kratos and Atreus believe to be the highest peak. Before reaching the top, they overhear a conversation between the sons of Thor, Modi and Magni, and the stranger. They have a man, Mimir, trapped in a tree. Once they leave, Kratos and Atreus finish the climb. Mimir goes about spoiling their trip and informs them that this is, unfortunately, not the highest peak in the realm. That honor would go to Jotunheim. Mimir asks that his head be cut off so they can seek out a witch to reanimate his head, freeing him from the clutches of the tree. Kratos obliges, and once the witch is found, the reanimation is a success. At which point, Mimir is attached to the waist of Kratos and tags along on the journey to Jotunheim. Of course, getting there is not a simple jaunt. Because it's in another realm, you need to access it through a portal. But of course, the portal doesn't currently allow access to Jotunheim, and thusly the bulk of the narrative is born. Kratos, Atreus, and Mimir venture out to fix the portal to access Jotunheim so they can reach the highest point. And that's God of War's narrative. Every protagonist needs a purpose. The developers decided that the reason Kratos and his son should go through unimaginable dangers, fight terrible monsters, and be at the mercy of gods was to... dump a bag of ashes at a very specific place? It feels like a pretty weak purpose. Sure, it seems pretty important to Kratos and Atreus that they complete this, but you don't think it ran through their head that they might just drop those ashes off at the first peak they were at? 
Not even once. I mean, she's dead. She's not going to know where she was dumped, will she? I mean, look, if my mom died and wanted me to dump her ashes off the highest balcony at Lambeau Field, I would do my best to fulfill her wishes. But if that balcony was guarded by fucking dragons, I'm sorry, Ma, but you're getting dumped off at the nearest sports bar. It just feels like a silly reason for them to go through so much trouble. By game's end, the trek seems so much more worth it. But leading up to the end, I regularly asked myself, am I really going through all of this so I can dump a fucking bag of ashes? I think that Kratos and Atreus' main narrative objective could have been stronger. I'm not saying get rid of Dusty Mom completely, but perhaps add another purpose to the story that justifies such a grand journey. Kratos' character development is interesting because, though I love the guy, in previous God of War titles, he really lacked dimension. Screaming and carrying on while jamming your blades into people and things does not a very interesting character make. I mean, he's badass, no doubt. I wouldn't want to meet him in a back alley but he isn't in line to be the next Oseki's spokesman either. This installment of God of War does a phenomenal job of developing Kratos into something more than a Grecian meathead. As the story unfolds, you learn that Kratos is ashamed of his past dealings with the Greek gods. And by dealings, I mean eviscerating, like, all of them. Now that he has a son, he does everything in his power to keep his past from him. Though as you can imagine, things come to a head at a certain point, and Kratos is forced to face his past with Atreus at his side. And while the relationship between Atreus and Kratos is initially tense, Kratos becomes a better father over the course of the game. Instead of beating Atreus down at his every failure, he gives him constructive feedback. He starts to praise him for making good decisions and being a helpful partner on the journey. He teaches Atreus to channel his rage at the right time to be an effective warrior. It turns out that Kratos isn't half bad at dadding by the end of the game. I like the new Kratos. He still has that murderous rage that we know and love from the previous games, but he's wiser. He knows how to channel his rage. It's how I imagine Christian Bale would be if he was on a maintenance dose of SSRIs. And this has already been memed to Helheim and back. But Kratos pretty much only refers to Atreus as boy. If I had to make a guess as to what percentage of the time Kratos calls Atreus boy, I think the most conservative of estimates would put it at 90%. If Atreus' monikers were the now retired food pyramid, boy would be the grains. And the fruits. And the vegetables and dairy, and meat. Suffice to say, Kratos says boy a load in this game. And it's a situation that leaves me puzzled, because he says it enough that it sticks out and feels awkward and unnatural. Did Santa Monica Studios not realize just how often he calls Atreus boy, or were they fully aware and did it as a troll? At the very least, the God of War community has playfully memed this quirk to death, so I think it saves some face for the developers. Speaking of boy, let's talk about the boy himself, Atreus. Admittedly, I was nervous when I saw the trailer for God of War because I thought it would be incredibly difficult to have a child follow you around the entire game without it getting grating because, let's face it, children are the fucking worst. I was afraid that Atreus was going to be a Norse Carl Grimes. Oh my god, fuck that character, I hate that petulant twerp. I stopped watching The Walking Dead because of him. Anyway, it took some big balls for the developers to have Atreus at Kratos' hip the entirety of the game. Big, meaty balls. No scratch that, it took gigantic balls that are 50% meat and 50% brass. And you know what? Sometimes having big balls pays off. The developers did a fantastic job of building Atreus as a character. You see him go through so many different stages of development. First he is timid around Kratos, then he slowly builds a relationship with him, he struggles with his identity, keep in mind Kratos is a god so, well you connect the dots. And by game's end the relationship he has with Kratos is a completely different shade than it was in the beginning. I really did enjoy Atreus as a character. Sure, he was occasionally a whiny little shit, but that needs to be thrown in occasionally to make him a believable child. I think that Atreus, even more so than Kratos, was the most difficult character to develop because of the fact that a line needed to be towed between realism and avoiding the insanity that is being around a child, and the developers did a smashing job with this boy. And while Kratos and Atreus are well fleshed out characters, the developers didn't stop there. The ancillary characters are phenomenal as well. Brock and Sindri are dwarven brothers who split their blacksmithing business because of differences. Brock is crude, brash, and not afraid to speak his mind, while Sindri is a neat freak who gets queasy at the slightest mention of anything unsettling. Both have verbal barbs for the other brother whenever you see them, which is really entertaining. Then there's Mimir who acts as a guide, has plenty of memorable one-liners throughout the game. And the witch almost becomes a mother to Atreus because, you know, you don't have one anymore. I didn't once get the sense that any of these characters were there because they just needed fillers. Each one felt well-rounded, multi-dimensional, and contributed positively to the game's overall narrative. 
and if you really want to get into Norse mythology, Atreus takes notes along your journey that you can go back and read. It isn't going to match up with established Norse mythology exactly, but I was surprised at the amount of detail and care that went into including the mythology that does live within the game. It was enough that it made me interested in researching these tales more outside of the game. If a game's narrative makes me interested enough to research a topic on my own, it's doing something right. While God of War's premise wasn't terribly convincing, endure hellish dangers so you can bring dead mom ashes to the high speak and dispose of them, and not this one, that one, it is completely forgiven because of the fantastic cast of characters. I found myself enjoying every single character I interacted with, and none of them felt like they were shoehorned into the game. God of War's narrative gets an A-. Come. No looking back now. The gameplay in this installment of God of War differs significantly from its predecessors. Don't worry, there's still plenty of puzzle solving and evisceration to go around, but it certainly has a different feel to it. Your primary weapon to begin God of War is the Leviathan Axe. The gimmick of the Leviathan Axe is that Kratos can throw it and recall it. I imagine that another Norse weapon was the inspiration for the axe. I was apprehensive about the combat, being Kratos was without the Blades of Chaos, but I quickly fell in love with the Leviathan Axe. It's a versatile weapon. You can size up groups of enemies, make a few ranged attacks if you wish, and then dive into the action and beat the ever-living out of some baddies. Or you can sit back and keep pecking away at their health with ranged throws, or say f the throws and start swinging away. See, that's the great thing about the axe. It's one weapon that allows for multiple fighting strategies. Furthermore, you'll have the ability to unlock more moves as you gain experience points. See, games don't always need to be packed with an avalanche of different weapons to keep things varied and interesting. Kratos can also equip a light and heavy runic attack. These are attacks that use runic energy, which, after use, requires a cooldown. You'll gather these runes throughout the course of the game. There are quite a few to choose from. My go-to heavy attack is the Frost Giant's Frenzy, in which Kratos takes three powerful axe swings to grind up whatever the f has the misfortune of being in front of him at the moment. In addition to runic attacks, you can also equip a Talisman. Talismans grant Kratos an ability or boost his stats when hitting a button command to activate it. Some activate automatically or have additional passive effects. For most of the game, I used the Talisman of Concentrated Vitality, which gave me a burst of health when activated, because I'm shit at combat and need all the extra health I can get because I bleed like a stuck pig on Kumadin. And... Uh, I don't know if I should say it. F*** it, I'm gonna say it. Skip ahead just a little bit if you want to avoid a spoiler. Okay? You made up your mind? You sure? Alright, here goes. The boys are backing down, boys are backing down. Yes, that's correct. Old lefty and righty make a comeback. The Blades of Chaos make a triumphant return. Just as I had accepted the Leviathan Axe would be my weapon moving forward, God of War drops a bomb and brings back the Blades of Chaos. And I didn't know if this would be possible, but I think it's even more satisfying using them now than it did using them in the previous God of War games. Perhaps it's just a case of absence makes the heart grow fonder, but holy f when they brought them back, they did it in cavalier fashion. I had goosebumps all over and had to get a moistened towelette for my hinterlands, and pretty much everything I mentioned previously also applies to the Blades of Chaos. You can unlock more moves, equip a light and heavy runic attack, etc. You can't throw them like you do the Leviathan Axe, but you can throw them the distance of the chain, which makes for some cool GET OVER HERE! Scorpion moments. And I should also mention that the Leviathan Axe has Frost Energy, the Blades of Chaos Fire Energy. This is good to know when fighting certain enemies that may be more vulnerable to one type or the other, and it's also used to solve some puzzles. Yet another element to consider while fighting is Atreus. Atreus is going to be your partner in crime for most battles. Remember how I was talking about the big balls earlier? This was another element of God of War that I was concerned about and certainly took big old danglers to implement. If you're going to be required to have a friendly AI with you in battle, you really need to do it carefully as to not feel like they're useless or having to babysit them. Yes, I know Kratos is his dad, but it's a 
fucking game. Can we suspend reality a little bit here so that Kratos doesn't need to look after Atreus even in the midst of the heated battle? Anyway, I think the gang at Santa Monica Studios executed Atreus in battle to near perfection. If you leave Atreus to his own devices in battle, he can pretty much handle himself. His main weapon is the Talon Bow, and he'll occasionally take pot shots here and there to assist you. He can also choke enemies with his bow to keep them stationary for you while you go in with the Leviathan Axe. Sometimes Atreus will get grabbed by an enemy and you'll need to run over to assist him, but I find it doesn't happen very often and you're given plenty of time to go over and save him. But leaving Atreus to himself is not the best way to utilize him. If you want to sap his full potential, you need to direct Atreus what to do. Atreus has, at the start, three arrows in his Talon Bow Quiver at one time that you can direct him to fire. This gets really handy if you find yourself getting swarmed by enemies because Atreus's arrows can redirect aggro. You also have the ability to upgrade Atreus's abilities with the Talon Bow, much like you can with the Leviathan Axe. I decided to invest a lot of my experience points in boosting Atreus, and it paid off. He did a significant amount of damage during my battles, and in some cases I didn't even need to touch any enemies because Atreus was able to pick them all off before they got to me. Atreus also has a runic attack he can perform with the Talon Bow. Atreus can summon a runic animal, which depends on the animal you have equipped, that can assist you in battle. I stuck with the Wrath of the Wolf for most of the game, which summons some elemental wolves that jump into enemies dealing damage. <laughs> So that's combat in God of War. Did you notice something? You feel a little overwhelmed? Yeah, it's, I've got a 50 page paper due at 8 a.m. and I haven't picked a topic yet and it's 3 a.m. now and fuck, the Red Bulls run dry. Overwhelming. While the combat's fun, it's satisfying, don't get me wrong on that point, there's just too damn much going on. Let's have a quick recap of the combat elements we just spoke about. We have the Leviathan Axe, that other thing, light and heavy runic attacks, you have a talisman you can activate, you have Atreus with his talon bow, his own runic attack, oh and did I mention that Kratos can fight without a weapon too? Yeah, he can go old school fisticuffs which also have their own lengthy moveset, and fighting hand to hand also introduces the spartan rage mechanic, which sends Kratos into a murderous bare knuckled beat em up frenzy, and that also has its own moveset. So we're talking about 4 potential movesets here, Leviathan Axe, that thing, hand to hand, and Spartan Rage, plus runic moves, plus the Talisman, plus Atreus, plus Atreus' runic move, holy f I thought I bought God of War, not Mortal Kombat. I know that there was button memorization in the other God of War games too, this feels like way too many factors to consider while going into battle. And on the whole, I didn't struggle with battles, that was fine, it's just that I feel like I didn't get to use the movesets and other mechanics to their full potential because of this classic case of paradox of choice. I regularly had to go back to the moves list for reference because I felt like I was leaving out effective and badass moves. And I was. I eventually moved out of the depression stage of grief and into acceptance. I decided that I would try to remember the moves I liked the best and largely ignore the others. And if I accidentally used the others while fighting, great. And those accidents happened more regularly than I care to admit. And I don't want to make this sound like the combat isn't fun or that it's tedious. It isn't. I quite enjoyed the combat overall. It's just... The gigantic buffet of potential moves is overwhelming and I feel like it could have been pared down for a more streamlined experience. But enough about combat, let's talk about the aftermath of battle. After dealing with your enemies, you'll gain experience points. Now, don't think of these experience points like you would in Pokemon or Final Fantasy. You don't gain these points and level up. Instead, you can think of them more as currency. You can spend these points on unlocking new moves for Kratos and Atreus, or upgrade already learned moves to make them more powerful. Other than dedicating a lot of points to Atreus, I didn't have much of a strategy when it came to spending my experience points. I just picked through moves that I thought were cool or ones that I thought would be easy to remember. A good thing about this though is, it isn't like specking in WoW. Do people even play that game anymore? I don't know, it's been a lifetime since I've played it. I don't even know if this is a relevant comparison anymore. But anyway, in WoW, I know that you had skill trees, and you couldn't say, Oh, I want to be a mage who does all three of these things. No, you had a finite amount of points to spend, so if you wanted to be effective, you had to specialize in one or two of the skill trees. Spreading your skill points out between all three probably wasn't a good option because you would rob yourself the opportunity to get to the very bottom of one tree, which is usually where the more powerful skills live. In God of War, experience points aren't finite. You should be able to go out there and fight baddies if you want more points to spend. So in theory, you don't really need to specialize. Over time, you should be able to unlock most of the moves. So that's a plus, because skill specking is a high anxiety activity for me. 
as is pretty much everything in life. On to armor and stat specking. As mentioned earlier, you don't level up with XP, but you do have an overall level. This is determined by the gear you have Kratos equipped with. Kratos has waist, wrist, and chest armor. Some armor has sockets that you can fit with enchantments. Some of the enchantments are basic, granting a boost to strength or some other stat. Some enchantments are conditional, giving Kratos a stat boost if he performs an evade or parry. As you get higher leveled armor, you get more available sockets for enchantments. You can get armor by looting, crafting, purchasing, or you can upgrade existing armor. Crafting, purchasing, and upgrading takes place at one of Brock or Sindri's shops. This was sometimes confusing because I wasn't sure if I should spend my resources upgrading existing armor, or wait until better armor is available to purchase, or just craft it outright. I didn't find myself enjoying the armor build and stat building associated with it. It suffers the same issues as combat where there is so much going on it's difficult to make a decision. I don't like staring at the armor menu for a half hour while an internal meltdown ensues because I can't decide if I should pick the enchantment that gives Kratos plus 5 strength or plus 5 defense. I stare at the screen until the black slowly creeps in and before I know it I wake up on the floor in a puddle of vomit because I'm incapable of making a simple decision. Neuroses aside, the expanse of options for armor and enchantments is probably a plus for a lot of people. So consider that you're viewing this through the lens of an individual who prefers streamlined options. So what about the rest of the game? Well, I would classify God of War as a quasi-linear game. There is a clear main storyline that you can follow, and the rails are pretty obvious. But there's other little tasks or exploration that can be done, if you're wanting to take a break from the main narrative. And the world is pretty expansive. But it's not an expansive world filled with nothingness like a lot of open world games. Every area feels like it has a purpose. It isn't filler. And because of this, I think God of War is partway between linear and open world. And I like that Atreus specifically reminds you of this. At certain points, he'll say something like, we can go ahead and do thing X, or we can do some exploring too. The game gives you a friendly reminder that you can take a break from the main story to take in the side content. The puzzles in God of War are great, the developers struck a perfect balance of difficulty. I didn't feel like the solutions were spoon fed to me, but I also didn't have to furiously search for the solution on game FAQs only to find out no one has written a walkthrough yet because the game just came out. D do you even know what game FAQs is? It's a site where users write walkthroughs for games? No? <sighs> F*** me, I'm getting old. Anyway, the puzzles are really satisfying and well-constructed, and Atreus will give you occasional pointers if you start wandering around for too long. Something like, hey, look at this thing on the ceiling, or I don't think we have what we need for that yet. One type of recurring puzzle that I enjoyed in particular were Nornir chests, which have three lighted rune symbols on them. The goal is to make all three symbols disappear, which unlock the chest. It usually consists of finding relics with symbols on them that you destroy, or three bells you have to ring simultaneously, or something similar to that. And little pro tip, if you see one of these things, you're gonna wanna solve it. Don't be tempted to fuck along and continue with the story. Stop, take your time, and solve it. If need be, go to that ancient website I referred to earlier, but whatever you do, don't skip them. Solve them, open them, then move on. And I won't get too much into the side content you can complete to avoid spoilers, but just trust me, there's a lot. And it's all enjoyable too. I quite enjoyed traveling around Midgard by just exploring random areas to see what the developers hid. But there's also some favors you can complete for the inhabitants of the realms if you're looking for more guided content. This is the amazing thing about God of War. I've already mentioned it before with the other aspects of the game, but nothing feels out of place. No filler. It's just... wow. Wow. While some of the gameplay decisions were not seasoned to my taste, like an overabundance of combat mechanics and boring character specking, Everything else is done so well that I can't help but give God of War's gameplay a perfect A. Let's start with the audio. God of War features an orchestral track list composed by Bear McCreary. I hate to admit this, but I largely didn't notice the music while I was playing the game. The problem with this being, the tracks are actually really solid. What I found when listening to the tracks after the fact is that they're very emotional and they were perfect for God of War in this new Norse mythological setting. And sometimes that's the tragedy of good music in video games. It reminds me of a quote from Futurama. <laughs> when you do things right, people won't be sure you've done anything at all. And I think that's what's happened here. 
because the music blends in so well with all of the other elements of God of War, it just didn't stand out. But sometimes standing out can be a bad thing. Overall, Mr. McCreary did a great job here. But what I really want to point out is the voice acting in God of War. Holy f***, it's so good. Let's start with Kratos. You may have noticed a change in voice, and that's because there is. T.C. Carson provided the voice for Kratos in the previous titles. For this iteration, Santa Monica Studios went with Christopher Judge. Side by side, Judge's voice definitely has a nice bellow to it that Carson's voice did not. Wretched beast! I know who it is you serve! Return to your master! Tell the God of War I am his no longer. Tell him he is not safe while I walk the earth. I will find Pandora's box. And I will use it to see him tremble and fall before me. I guess. I know you overheard my talk with Freya. You think you understand, but you do not. Why do you say nothing? You said I was cursed. You think I'm weak because I'm not like you. I know I was never what you wanted. But after all this, I thought maybe things were different. You do not know everything, boy. And this is not to say Carson's performances weren't good. They were. His voice helped shape Kratos. But because this is a bit of a reboot and Kratos has aged, this feels like an appropriate change to his voice. Judge's performance was awesome, and I hope that he voices Kratos again if there's a sequel in the future. But even more impressive than Judge's performance was that of Sonny Suljic. Hope I'm saying that name right. Sorry if I'm not. Boy! Sonny provided the voice for Atreus. I know this comes down to writing as well, but I found myself enjoying Atreus' presence. Despite being a young boy, his character didn't come off as irritating or annoying in the least, except for when he was supposed to be coming off that way. I found that, more often than not, I look forward to what he had to say, and the interactions he had with other characters in the world were immensely enjoyable. And as you progress through the game, and Atreus becomes less boy, and more man, this is reflected in the voice acting. You did a bang up job, Sonny. I'm not going to go over everyone's performance, but all the main characters you encounter throughout the game were voiced superbly. This voice acting cast really deserves some recognition for their fantastic work on this game. I don't even have anything smarmy to say about it, they did a great job. On to the visuals. What stands out most is that God of War features no camera cuts. The game is played as one continuous camera shot. In a world where a cancerous overuse of jump cuts in YouTube videos to artificially hold audiences attention reigns supreme, it was another ballsy move by the gang at Santa Monica Studios. Everything else aside, this is probably what impressed me most about God of War. Excluding cuts makes for an incredibly immersive experience, and we aren't talking about a little two hour narrative game that sans camera cuts. No, God of War's main story takes 25 hours to complete. 25 hours of continuous, no-cut action? <laughs> bravo, lads, bravo. That alone is an achievement worth celebrating. There's also an immersive heads-up display option which gets rid of the HUD to make for an even more cinematic experience. I found that I relied on the HUD too much to have it turned off permanently, but it was a nice feature to try out for short stretches of time. The environment in God of War is beautiful. It's worth exploring Midgard and the other realms just to see the amount of work and research that went into creating this world. I say research because you'll find the realms take plenty of inspiration from Norse mythology and Viking culture. The character models are impressive too. I think I could probably count the hair on Kratos' beard. Along the journey you'll find a variety of interesting enemies. There's a cat thing that burrows into the ground and digs towards you a la Tremors, undead, werewolves, trolls, White walkers, oh, wait, what the fuck, white walkers? Uh, anyway, my personal favorite visually are revenants, which are these things that I guess are like witches, but I only like their visual design. Actually fighting them is a fucking nightmare. God of War's audio gets an A, and the visuals an A-. Thank you, God.
God of War runs the standard AAA price of $59.99 for the standard edition, which is what I purchased. The main storyline took me about 27 hours to complete, and on average looks like it takes about 25 hours. I know that I have a lot of side content remaining, so I did a bit of research and it looks like the additional content plus main storyline takes about 50 hours to complete. Wow, that is a lot of content packed into a game. But remember, it isn't only the length of the content, but the quality. And having already played some of the side content, I can tell you that the quality is just as good as the main story. And did I mention there's no microtransactions either? Everything you can acquire in the game, you can acquire in the game, without spending an extra penny. It's sad that I have to celebrate things like this, but these are the dark, dark times we live in. God of War gives you around 50 hours of smashingly good content without a single microtransaction for $59.99. Totally worth the price. And another perfect A. Don't give me that look. Remember, humans are animals after all. And my animal instinct was telling me that I needed to eat every one of these tasty little bastards. So that I can sulk in shame and go to bed feeling like a bloated whale. I don't think that the paleo diet was really for me anyway. You know, I think that fat diets in general are probably a pretty bad idea. It's all about balance. Moderation. And that's why I'm going to be switching to a completely liquid diet. Starting tomorrow, of course. As for God of War, plugging the component grades into my rubric leaves it with a final grade of... Do, do I need to tell you? It's an A. Of course it's an A. Homo erectus could have told you that. And students, until next time, I remind you to always stay cynical.